Hello, everyone. Dr. A.P. Canavan and I are back for another Malazan discussion. And this time we are doing something special because we, we love these poems, don't we? The, the Malazan poems, the epigraphs, there's just so much you can glean from them. And there was a particular Malazan poem that as I was reading Orb Scepter Thrown by Ian C. Esselmont, I was so struck by this poem. And it might sound a little weird for me to say this AP, but I felt like Esselmont put that poem in there just for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> which of course is not the case. That's a silly thing to say, but I was just so happy. I was so excited when I saw this particular poem and it is the epigraph to chapter four of Orb Scepter Throne. And the reason why I was so excited is as you know very well, you might recall, I did uh, an analysis of a Steven Erickson epigraph, uh, The Age Descending, which is from the Bone Hunters. And you also did an analysis of that. And, and then I, you, I think you find I did a better analysis of that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my nemesis talking again. Oh, <laughs> see, the fireballs are whizzing my way already. Oh, <laughs> boy. And I forgot my flame retardant elbow patches today. Oh, well. So <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, the we both did a very nice analyses of the poem and Stephen Erickson got in on the action even. Mine was better. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Somebody's going to make a meme out of that one, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So... <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> so yes, as I was saying, I got really excited when I saw this because everything that I said about Stephen Erickson's The Age Ascending is almost more applicable to what Ian Esselmont has done in Song of the Exiles. That is the, the epigraph poem to chapter four in Orb Scepter Throne. So I was just so excited because actually, as, as I think people will see shortly, Esselmont uh, did a much closer thing to the Old English poem, The Wanderer, which I mentioned as an, an example of Ubisunt poetry. Uh, so uh, yes, this is also an Ubisunt poem, but you know, it's so much fun to read both series for me because yes, they're anthropologists and they're archeologists, but also Esselmont uh, has uh, done graduate level work in English literature. And I, the last time we talked with him, he actually brought out his uh, Old English reader. So I know he's read some Old English poetry. So, and that's of course evident, you'll see when we talk about this particular poem, but let's read the poem first. Well, hi, before, before we get started on the poem, yes. one thing I want to point out, you said you felt almost like he had written this for you because you had done your master's on this poem like this this was part of your master's degree was working right. in translation with poem and analysis of this poem yes. and i'll offer as i often do a slightly different interpretation yeah you are absolutely the last person in the world <laughs> ian cs <laughs> wanted seeing this poem because you're one of about like 50 people who's going to look at this and go hang on a second I know where that author stole that poem from. <laughs> it's called an homage, AP, that I think, it's, right? This, this is bold face stealing, but doing it really well. <laughs> no, doing it with class. Well. well, what he's done is he's malazanized the poem. He has taken an excerpt from The Wanderer and he has malazanized it very skillfully and importantly, because I think you'll see when AP and I start talking about the tweaks that he's made to the wanderer what you'll see is that he's actually done some really cool stuff in terms of hinting at the themes in orb scepter throne so it's it's really cool actually so yeah sorry uh cam i i did notice uh the <laughs> the wanderer uh as a source but i was so delighted with it nevertheless so anyway let, let's bring up the uh see if i can figure out the technology here I am bringing up the poem so everyone can see it. And uh, AP, why don't you read it for everybody? And I will scroll down as you read. Okay. Now, bearing in mind, I haven't practiced this, but I'll give it a go. And he who knew many conflicts spoke these words. 
Where have the swordsmen gone? Where is the gold giver? Where are the feasts of the hall? Alas for the bright dome, alas for the fallen splendor. Now that time has passed away, dark buried in night as if it never been. Where lay the servants wound round with wards, brought low by warriors and their cruel spears. Now storms beat at rocky cliffs, the bones of the earth harbingers of storm. All is strife and trouble in earthly kingdoms. Here men are fleeting, here honour is fleeting. All the foundation of the world turns to waste. Oh, that's a lovely reading. Thank you. Very nice. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the 22 lines from the poem, The Wanderer in Old English. I have here my edition of the Exeter book edited by Crap and Dobby, which is, if you're an Old English person, this is like kind of very special. It's very nostalgic for me. Uh, so I'm going to read it out of there. It's lines 88 to 110 of The Wanderer. First, I'll read in Old English. And then, as AP said, I wrote my master's thesis on this particular poem. I did a, an addition and a translation, and I explored the oral formulaic underpinnings of the poem. And that's going to be kind of important later as well. So uh, I will explain all that later, though. Let me just read the poem in Old English, and then I'll read my translation. And you can kind of follow along when I do the translation you'll see how closely Esselant has modeled this poem from it. So here we go. Lines 88 to 110 of The Wander in Old English. Uh, sorry, uh, 88, here we go. Sathona fista whale's tail, wiza yathochta, on this der caliph deopa yon thanketh. Frod in ferva, fair of yamon, while sleachta worn on thus word a quiv. Warko mer, warko mago, warko mathum giva, warkom simbla gesetu, war zinden sel adreamas, eala bert bruna, eala birnwiga, eala theodnes trim, who seth rag yawat, in ap under nichtelm, so he no wara, standeth nu on lasta, leo vradugava, well wundrum heach, wirmlikam fach, erlas for noman, asha frida, Wapen wal yifru, weird Samara, on thus don hlalthu stormus knissath, read reosenda hrusan bindeth, wintris woma, don a won kumeth, nippeth nicht shua, north anon sendeth, reo hagel fara haleth a monandan. Yal is erbot vish, erth and richa, on wendeth weirdo yeshert, werold under hebonum. Her bith feoch lana, her bith freund lana, her bith mon lana, her bith my lana. El this earth an yestel, idel werfeth. So there's the old English, and I'll put this away now. And... You know, I guess it, before you start, yes. that was really well done, Philip. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a lot of fun with that. And you can see, by the way, that Esselmont has not duplicated the, um, the, the meter, if you will, of the old English which has four stresses in every line and alliterates, obviously. So uh, he has strayed from the, um, the meter and the alliteration, the alliterative aspects of it. But, but you'll see as I read the translation that he comes pretty close to the words. So here's my translation of lines 88 to 110. He who then wisely considers this wall foundation and deeply meditates on this dark life, old and wise in spirit, often remembers from afar the many slaughters and utters this word. So that's uh, much longer than what Esselmont has here, but utters this word is close to spoke these words. And then it goes into, where has the steed gone? Where the youth? Where the giver of treasure? Where the house of feasts? Where are the hall joys? So you can see pretty close uh, correspondence there, yes? And then, alas, the bright cup, alas, the mailed warrior, alas, the prince's glory, how that time has departed, darkened under the shadow of night as if it never were. And you can see again, pretty close correspondence there in, in the, the uh, what is that, the third and fourth stanzas. 
-hmm. And then I'm going to scroll down here so everybody can keep following along with the poem. And keep reading here in, in my translation. Back to my translation. The beloved company now stands on the track by a wall wondrously high decorated with serpents. The might of the ash spear has borne off the men, weapons greedy for slaughter, fate the glorious. And storms, and now I want to point out this part. Uh, yeah, we're still, okay, yeah. And th this stanza that begins in Esselmont's poem, now storms beat at rocky cliffs. This is a classic image of exile in Old English poetry, in oral formulaic poetry. This image of a storm beating on a cliff is associated directly with exile, which is very important for what Esselmont is doing here, because as we'll explain later, this is about the Sagula. So, but anyway, and storms batter the stone cliffs, the falling snowstorm binds the earth, winter's harbinger, then dark comes. The shade of night blackens from the north is driven, the fierce hailstorm for the vexation of men. All is fraught with hardship in the kingdom of earth. The course of fate transforms the world under the heavens. Here wealth is fleeting, here friend is fleeting, here man is fleeting, here kinsman is fleeting. All this earthly foundation will become desolate. Okay, so you see some tweaking there. And we've, we're, we've highlighted those and AP and I are going to talk about the yeah. tweaks and why they're there, we think. Uh, so before, before we start in on that, what I have to say is your translation is far better and much, uh, much more evocative than the translation of the Wanderer that I had found online just to remind myself before we were doing this. Oh, okay, thank the you. The one I found <laughs> online, absolutely rubbish yeah there there are some bad translations that's for sure yeah well it's but it's trying to translate concepts into modern english from old english i mean that that is a skill i mean that is it is quite difficult because it is, it is yeah um even something like weapons the word for weapon it, it there are different ways that word that in old english that you translated to weapon or uh, that uh. someone used it can be translated different ways. Yeah, yes. And not only that, but uh, the, given the sort of culture that it is, they would have, they have so many different words for a sword. <laughs> and there are so many kennings for it as well. And and the, sometimes there are connotations that go along with one meaning that don't quite, you know, uh, get carried along with, with another word. So it, it is a tricky, any kind of translating is a tricky business. But I think especially when you're dealing with a dead language as well, uh, it, it complicates it even more perhaps, but but yeah, it's a lot of fun for me anyway. Um, but of course, this is in the uh, Esselmont titles, his, his poem, um, Song of the Exiles. And exile is a huge part of what the wanderer is all about. So this is an obvious association, uh, but he also clues us into what this is about with the word can't. And Kant is the main city uh, where the, on the island where the Sagula live in exile. So this is a, a clue that we are talking about the Sagula, correct? And at this point, perhaps we should warn everyone, if you are very sensitive to spoilers, AP and I are going to be talking some spoilers in a very general broad sense for Orb, Scepter, Throne um, in the next, uh, well, for the rest of the video, actually. So just... And if, but if you're okay with some very vague spoilers, then uh, keep watching. And I will try not, I'll try to keep it very vague because yeah. I, I think there's some very specific points here, but we, we'll, we'll deal with it in a, in a more general sense. Yeah, and I think if we, if we are just too tempted to point out something because it's too cool, we will warn you and say, okay, this is a very specific spoiler. So plug your ears or whatever. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right, so uh, as I said, this is about the Segula, and that's fairly obvious when it says can't. I think that that's the giveaway there. Um, but one of the first uh, clues as well within the poem itself is Esselmont changes uh, this, where has this, have the steeds gone or where has the steed gone to where have the swordsmen gone, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty and good giveaway. Well, I, well, let, let's have let's have a think. Even even about Kant, yes, there's the literal Kant, uh, Segula Island connection. Yeah, Kant uh, being you know cannot. 
uh, ah. they cannot change. Uh, huh. the, this this whole thing um, about the willingness to change. And if we think, even without going into this particular book, what we know about the Segula is that they are heavily regimented, heavily structured and stratified society that is locked into a very specific way of doing things. So there's that wonderful little uh, point of connection. Whether or not it's intended, who knows? And the third thing is, if you think Kant as in a sailor's Kant, as in a ah. style of uh, uh, talking, singing, or or, or even poetry. Yeah. So I, it, there's just a wonderful play on that one word at the very beginning. And I love little things like this because regardless of whether or not they add to the very specific meaning that say Esselmont had for it. Right. It gives you a wonderful sense of depth to the possibilities of what's going on in the poem. So I just, I wanted to highlight that before we moved moved on any further because you know, yeah. I like these little things at the, at the top that try and tease out uh, just ways of maybe thinking about the poem. And I like and... how you like those little things. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. Yeah. So we have the swordsman replacing the steed and that's obvious. No, and hang on a sec. You, you keep skipping on to the oh, good dear. bits. Philip. You I need to something. set these things up. Oh, so dear. Look, look, look at that opening stanza. And he ah. who knew many conflicts spoke ah, these words. Yeah. So think of uh, how much of the stories that we get told in the Malazan world, both the Malazan Book of the Fallen and, and novels of the Malazan Empire, are about the power of story about the power of a storied history, yeah. about the, the permanence of, of historians, archeologists, uh, the bards. All of this is a flavor that is very, very important to both uh, the novels of the Malazan Empire and the Malazan Book of the Fallen. These are characters who recur time and time again. These are epigraphs that occur time and time again that are the keys to understanding everything. And here we have, again, someone who is a veteran, someone who knew many conflicts, is going to tell us something, is going to relay something, is going to sing us the song of the exiles. So again, we have this connection to the, the bard, the troubadour, the scald, the scop, all these different types of ways of telling these stories, of singing these stories, of, of conveying history and culture and a sense of purpose. Yeah. Yeah, well said. I love that. And of course, the many conflicts is something that seems very fitting with the Segula. <laughs> so and so now, now we can go on to the and we move we on to, to the about. swordsman now. My goodness. Okay, so <laughs> the swordsman, the uh, gold giver also. Okay, so obviously Segula are swordsmen. Uh, extraordinaire. They are the best, the very best in the Malazan world with swords. So that's a fairly obvious, you know, change that that Esselmont has made in here. Gold giver is an interesting one because it comes straight out of the Old English poem, but there is a, an interesting, and this is a bit of a spoiler here, but there is some, there is a particularly um, an aspect of Orb, Scepter, Throne that involves a gold mask that is uh, uh, important for the plot. So yeah, that is an interesting connotation that it takes on as a Malazan poem, isn't it? Even though it is straight out of the original. Um, and and that again, we've we've spoken about this before. That um, meaning is context dependent, and when you have a line that means one thing in one poem, when it's placed in the context of something else, suddenly it can acquire radically different meaning, ra uh, radically different connotations even, and yeah. these different points of connection that just just changing a couple things around can suddenly give it an entirely new uh, resonance. And where you have that, that phrase, basically gold giver in, in the original, in the context of Orb, Scepter, Throne, there is a much deeper resonance created with a very specific plot point and, and um, series of events and, and the history of the world. Yeah. So that, particularly with its, its point of connection to where have the swordsmen gone, where is the gold giver, and the, uh, how close those two lines are together, 
which gives you that closeness of the gold giver to the swordsman. Yeah, big hint. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I love it. Feast of the Hall is straight out of the original. I don't think we need to dwell on that too much. But the next line is a big one. Uh, so we, this is a bit of a spoiler. Uh, so again, if you're really sensitive, please don't listen to what we're, we're about to say about the bright dome, because in the original poem, it is the bright cup. The uh, Now, if you've read Orbs After Throne, you know that this reference to a bright dome is very important. Yeah. And so without talking about that aspect, we know in a very general sense. So I'll ask for the bright dome instead of the bright cup. There, there is a very literal point of connection here with what is going to happen in the novel. Because remember, this is very early on in the book. This, this isn't when you know these things are going to happen. So this is very much retrospectively going, oh my God, Esselmont put this right at the very, very start, didn't he? But what is really interesting here is it is, again, that closeness, that couplet has placed the bright dome with fallen splendor. Yeah. And that then has real connotations of, well, A, it is suggesting this dome is something of the past, but also fallen splendor. This, uh, it is fallen from grace. It's no longer beautiful. And if we think of the, the setting of the novel, which is Darugistan, this yeah. glowing jewel of a city, and it's the fallen splendor. So this hinting at a storied past. And we know that Darugistan is basically built on layer upon layer of history. Yeah. So this is spelling out something about Darugistan's past. Brilliant. And about the past of the Segula as well. And the, the Bright Dome obviously is relevant to their past. And it is something that they no longer have because they're saying, alas, right? There is a, there's a sense of lament here for something that was glorious and in the past the fall in splendor as you say so yeah that's really really cool stuff uh so shall we move on to the next stanza yep. okay so now that time has passed away dark buried at night as if it had never been now this is straight from the old english pretty much but when you say dark buried at night in the context of the malazan world and in the context of orb scepter throne uh, I think you have to say at least, uh, well, it's fairly obvious we're talking, this is about the Sagula, but you think immediately Tyst Andy, right? Yeah, and, and again, this is what I was saying about what you can take something that has a very specific meaning in an old English poem or, or in any poem, but yeah. when you put it here, the word night in Malazan, the word darkness in Malazan, even the word shadow yeah. in Malazan, has a, a connotation and point of connection that isn't present in other things because it's part of the world. It's part of the history of the world. It's part of the world building and the fabric of the narrative. It's, yeah. it's part of this whole diegetic setting. So using those terms, yes, we can still read them almost as if they were in uh, to be read in The Wanderer or heard in The Wanderer. Yeah. But now there is that suggestion. And what do we have in Orb Scepter Throne? There is something of the Andy being investigated here. Yeah, yeah, in a, in a very important way. So that's a poignant part of the poem that suddenly has multiple meanings as well as the original from the Old English. So beautifully done. I really love it. Um, how about those servants? Where lay the servants wound round with wards? And then they're paired with the warriors and their cruel spears, brought low by warriors and their cruel spears. So again, these are gonna, we're gonna have some vague spoilers when we talk about this. We can't avoid it really. So who are these servants? Who could they possibly be? And who are the warriors with their cruel spears? And yeah, like when you've read the book and you read those lines, you will suddenly see that and again think how much did Esselmont hide in plain sight at the very, very beginning. Yeah, 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 for sure. And there are a lot of servants, though, in, in I think it might, might even have more than one possible meaning as well, because there are several uh, groups of people who are described as servants in, in the well, story. Tell you what, Philip, why don't we finish going through this with this very general sense and then uh, we'll take like a, a really, really short break. So anyone who's scared of spoilers yeah. can can log off or, or, or turn off the video and we'll go back because there's a couple of points here that yeah. particularly with this and, and a couple of the earlier ones that 
to in order to make it clear, we have to use spoilers because yeah, yeah, yeah. otherwise we're, we're we're constantly talking round these things and we're not <laughs> being clear idea. about what it means. Great idea. We will come back to those lines uh, because I agree it would be so much more fun to just unleash the spoilers. So I'm scrolling down and so that everyone can see to the end of the poem here. Uh, now storms beat at rocky cliffs, the bones of the earth, harbingers of storm. That is pretty much straight out of the Old English. And as I said earlier, uh, the image of a cliff being beaten by a storm, and often in the Old English, there is a person underneath the cliff. But in every case, every case, and this is, this is part of what oral formulaic poetry does, there are certain images that are loaded with associations. And this particular image always comes up in the context of exile. And that is, of course, very relevant to the Segula, right? And you don't even have to have read Orb, Scepter, Throne to know that the Segula are exiles. Um, that, that's part of their narrative throughout all the series. So very cool. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Well, no, I, and that was a, that was a connotation I, I wasn't aware of that it was a, such an established technique within Anglo-Saxon poetry. Yeah, but one of the things I was going to say is it it fits with that because it's the bones of the earth, harbingers of storm. So bones, harbingers, rocky beat. This is about violent exposure. You know, you get all of those sorts of senses of being lost in in a violent darkness where uh, nature is assailing you, and there's no sucker there's no protection there's no safe harbor um so it is that that exposure to the world and the elements which ties in obviously with that emotion that you would feel as an exile so yeah. you can understand why these things work so well as symbols or uh, motifs associated with exile brilliant yeah and then you have the rest, and I think there's only one word that I would pause on in the rest of the poem. Most of it comes straight from the Old English. All is strife and trouble in earthly kingdoms here. Men are fleeting here. Honor is fleeting, and honor is a word that Esselman inserts into the poem. That is not in the original. There's a different thing that is fleeting in the original poem. And, and then all the foundation of the world turns to waste. So I would want to go back to that word honor. I think we'll save that, though, for the really... Uh, spoiler thing we're about to do because again but, it's just impossible to talk about otherwise so anything yeah, you want to say um, before we get to that and I, i'll say one of the things that we we talk about quite often when we talk about traditional narrative nowadays is that yeah. you have a tendency to set the scene the physical location the time period that happens first and then you put people in the scene and then the scene moves into action. And we, we typically have that progression a lot. Every time a, a chapter opens, uh, if next time you're reading a book, look at the first two paragraphs of a chapter and make a note just on a bit of paper for every time it starts off with describing the physical or temporal uh, setting and then moves on to introducing who is there and then moves on to something happening. And you'll find it actually happens quite a lot. The reverse is kind of happening here because what we have, we start with this absence. Where have these things gone? What happened to, alas, for the thing that used to be here? Yeah. Now that time has passed and it's as if it never was because there's nothing here anymore. This is all emptiness and, and loss. Right. And then it gets to, and now we get to the physical setting and then it's, and all is strife in the earthly kingdoms. It's that we're finally getting around to what is going on. The world is shit. There's war everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Everything is terrible. Um, <laughs> and so this this doesn't follow that traditional, well, no, sorry, traditional is the wrong word. This doesn't follow the, uh, the structure that we are so readily used to in narrative, which is why I love things like this because they do something different. Yeah, yeah, all right, fantastic. All right, I think it is time Let's just totally unleash these spoilers now. So if you're, I mean, go away if you don't want to hear this. Uh, but uh, for those of you who have read it, I think you probably will have seen some of these, but we really want to talk about them. So here we go. Um, and when Philip said go away, what he meant was thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate <laughs> you being here. Yes, that, that's what I meant. I, I'm sure they understood all that. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay, I right. think we're ready. Okay, right, full I, spoilers then. Full spoilers. Uh, here we go. So these servants, I think that's where we're one place where we really have to go. I know you yeah. had a very interesting interpretation of that. Well, because the, the first thing about this is where lay the servants uh, wound round with wards. If we think of uh, when we get into that chamber and the, the chamber has the, the side chambers coming off it, and you talk about the laying of bodies, bodies laid out to rest. Yeah. And this is where the, the Torrid Cabal had been buried with the tyrant and it had been sealed off with wards. And there's only one body left there that's still actually uh, bound with the wards uh, in one of the sealed chambers. And these were the servants. These were the um, the hands of the tyrant. So yeah. in that, where lay the servants wound round with wards, we could read very, very literally as that exact scene. Where are these, uh, these servants buried? And this is a yeah. significant sort of story element as the scholar on his excavation is digging these things up. Yeah. Which, you know, if he'd watched, uh, you know, Indiana Jones, he would know, stop digging up things that are cursed. <laughs> but so I, I think that little, that little couplet, um, or sorry, that, that little uh, set of two lines there yeah. works really, really well as an exact thing about this. Yeah. But, and as you'd, uh, you'd mentioned, there are other ways of thinking about this. Right. Because right. servants are not just the servants of the tyrant, right. uh, because we have Krupp as the sort of the master directing all of his servants and protecting them True. time and time again. Yeah. So it, it, there are these lovely points of connection. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. And of course, again, going back to the Segula, they are described as servants. Uh, of the tyrant in in their during their time in, in Darujistan until they escaped and they ca came later to think of that as an exile. So yeah, did we want to say anything more about the dome as well, the bright dome? Well, before we do that, it's uh, the the section where it's brought low by warriors and oh, their yes. cruel spears. Yeah, yeah. So remember, if the Segula are uh, the Segula, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, Cam, yeah. Um, if they're the swordsmen, <laughs> um, remember that the the Moranth don't face them in combat. It's all about distance between them and the Segula. Yeah. And what's the difference between someone wielding a sword and someone wielding a spear? Distance. Yeah. Where the swordsmen, uh, when they talk about the swordsmen, there's no negative connotation to that. But look at the connotation associated with the spear. It's ah. cruel. Ah. It's not honorable. It's standing back from someone. And that's surprising for you know something from Anglo-Saxon. There was no negative connotation to using a spear. Um, yeah. It was a perfectly acceptable weapon in battle. Yeah, although it hurts um, when you get hit with one. So maybe that's why it's cruel. <laughs> uh, but so that that's very interesting. And then when we think of when the tyrant was in Darugistan and yeah was destroyed the first time. We we know that Rast was put down by the Imas in league with Jaga. And the Imas were spear wielders because they were this tribal oh, society. Interesting. And then we think of the early hominids and the early people of um, Darugistan. And Darugistan was not known for its military class. Yeah. And so you have the, the whole thing about the spears being weapons that are easier to make in some crude sense than swords are easy to make huh. so the cruel spears if we we could look at cruel as in in that negative connotation or we could look at cruel as in they are uh, not neatly made and so they are crude spears uh, and that is suggestion then of the an uprising who has uh, these warrior uh, brought low by warriors and their cruel spears this uprising that got rid of the gold giver that got rid of the servants yeah. that got rid of the swordsman oh that's brilliant and that i think is a good segue then to the bright dome which is uh alluded to in the very title of the book orb scepter throne you come to realize that the orb is this dome that uh, served as uh, very importantly a, a protective device, a, a giant shield of a sort 
that uh, is especially relevant when we speak of the old enemies of the uh, of Darujistan, the Morans. Uh, so uh, it's uh, yeah, very important. And this is uh, something that seems to have achieved a legendary status among the Sagula in their exile as well. And it, it's wonderful how that legendary status of Darujistan with this glowing orb, this glowing dome that was so majestic when looked at from afar, because it clearly was a, a brilliant, beautiful, magical sight. And yeah. we have these descriptions of Darujistan having the walls and the towers made of that, uh, is it alabaster? Yes, but it is. beautiful white stone that was going to glow in this light yeah. that Darugistan was the city of lights. It was the city of this bright glow. And now in the contemporary setting, yes. Darugistan is still known as a city of lights, but it is a cold blue gas burning light. Yeah. And all of the they, they don't have white for anything. None of the buildings have white on them because it's associated with death. It's taboo. And, yeah. And that that is a, such a wonderful change to show how things can change, how cultures can change over time and how tradition and meaning can get twisted or part of it's forgotten, but the essential element of it remains. Yeah. I thought that the taboo on the, the alabaster, the white stone, was also an indication of just how traumatic the last time they had to deal with this tyrant was, that it was simply... Um, and it's become nothing but a, a vague memory. They don't know why even anymore. They, they don't have buildings made from this material, but they don't because there's just some bad association there. Uh, so it's really interesting how that tradition has, it's a very anthropological phenomenon that we're seeing here, isn't it? So. Yeah. And, and then the, the, the last point I wanted to bring up was um, the all is strife and trouble in earthly kingdoms. Here men are fleeting, here honor is fleeting. That. Yeah. that little stanza uh, and yeah in we can obviously link that very very directly to the stuff that's going to go on in the novel yeah. um but what i like about this is it's not just about this sagula it's not just about the maranth because the whole idea of here honor is fleeting when we look at some of the things we explored in the earlier that uh, esselmund explored in the earlier novels of the malazan empire what does it mean to be honorable what does it mean to live up to your word? Is it is betrayal, uh, you know, breaking your oath? We saw all of that investigated in Stonewielder. Yeah. And here we have here honor is fleeting that in this this moment where all of these different tribes are betraying each other, these tribes of of hominids uh, are betraying each other and fighting and these different kingdoms at war, there is betrayal all around and honor is fleeting. And what resolves this entire novel, Dasim, uh, Dasim's honor, the honor of the Segula, the honor of the Moranth, the honor of the Malazans. They yeah. all have to change. They all have to make a sacrifice and they all have to give something to the other side. And it, it's not a case of, you know, they all just stayed exactly where they were and they were rigid in their beliefs. Everyone had to become flexible. And in fact, here honor is fleeting. The exact opposite is how this book ends. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's not just, oh yeah, Esselmont's laying out everything that happens in the book in some respects, yes, but it, it, it's highlighting this as a theme. It's highlighting this as something to be paying attention to. That yeah. where it starts with where have the swordsmen gone, this last section is now all is strife all the foundation of the world so it's it's become universal and that i think is that nice signal that this is no longer just about the segula it's no longer just about the tyrant this is actually a bigger thing to be concentrating on yeah beautiful and at the same time it is also a, specifically about the segula who feel this burden this weight of shame and they're not sure what it is because this is a, a, a sort of a, a terrible secret that has been passed down only by the first, apparently to the next first. And Jan the second has a, a sense of this, a vague sense of this, where the, the source of the shame is. Uh, but he's not really entirely sure until we get through the book. 
And we learn what it is as well, that there's a sense of having failed in some way, even though really it was a good thing that the Sagula <laughs> were able to free themselves from Darujistan and, and the, the, uh, the horrible rule of the tyrant. But nevertheless, I think they had this weight, this feeling of having failed at some point in their history. Yeah, and and that again is how they thought of they thought of themselves as exiles. They thought they had been sent away. Yeah. That um and if you think they had originally been servants of this tyrant and the tyrant was evil, they had fought their way free of the tyrant when mm -hmm. the, the last tyrant was put down. But in order to do that, they had to betray their oaths because they were sworn to serve. They were sworn to serve someone that was evil, yes. So in order to get away, they had to betray that. Yeah. And for an honor bound society, for some, for a society that believes in honor, and perhaps that's why they elevate it so highly because it's something they felt they didn't have when they got away. And how do you get your honor back? You now become more honorable than everyone else. Yeah. That honor is all you elevate it. And that explains so much about their regimented caste driven society, I think. Yeah, I just think it's so lovely how this poem, which is so obviously inspired by an old English poem, The Wanderer, becomes with a few interesting changes, a, a sort of a key to this book. And I just love that, that, that how this poem resonates so nicely in terms of the themes of the book and even with specific events and the weight of the past and everything else. And that is something that is, exists in the original as well, this sense of life's fleetingness and the weight of the past and, and all of that, just beautifully done. So I, I'm so happy we got to talk about it because I just love the, the, what Esselman has done here. So, yeah. And like, I'm really happy that you were the one to, to sort of talk about this because I didn't know anything about that until you pointed it out. And, you know, we, we then you'd sent me a link to the poem and I, I sat and I read up on it and it suddenly it gains so much more resonance when I talk to someone who is a scholar in that field, who understands the, the Anglo-Saxon poem, who understands the importance of those things, because that's way out of my experience. That's that's not my field. Yeah. Um, so it's. Again, the, the fact that there are all of these different elements that make up literature, and this is something like I keep going back to. Literature, yes, we talk about our reading experience, we talk about what's there, and then we talk about the power of the books that we find when we discuss it with friends, when we discuss it on the, the, the fora uh, in discourse, or Discord, sorry, that, that's yeah. showing, showing my age. <laughs> I can laugh at you because I'm like probably worse, but yeah, um, discord. But, yeah. Uh, but in, in the exchange of information, in the, in the talking about these things, we can elevate the books even further because other people see things that we don't. And to be able to, to have these conversations, so, so valuable. So yeah. thank you very much, Philip. 100% agreed. And thank you, AP. And we're going to have another discussion, I think, upcoming. So we'll, we'll move on to that. But until next time, everyone.